hands to prove it's all untrue. But the, in the cold light of the day, the simple words still point away to one to others as you would have them do to you. So just lift up your eyes, don't pass by on the other side. Don't be bound what to think others may do. With a heart filled with love, it doesn't matter whether we believe in anything above. Do one to others as you would have them do you. Something like that. I don't know. There we go. Did I get cut off? Thank you. No, <laughs> no, not at all. Thank you very much. Yeah, cool. All right, it's seven o'clock and we're ready to start our salon. I just lost Bob. Um, anyway, Bob and I welcome you to our August salon. We are uh, on our fourth salon now by Cyberspace and we appreciate people who are uh, offering to speak, volunteering to speak and the people that are coming in to attend. And uh, let's say hi, Bob, now that you're back. Hi, Bob. Hello, Bob. Uh oh, did they freeze? They froze. Darn. <laughs> uh, Bob. Any tips on that, John? Only alternative is to sort of turn your video off to reduce throughput, and that, that might mess up what you guys are going for. But if it gets Bob. really bad, we could all we could all turn our our video off. What's that, John? Bob, you were, Bob I turn my video you were frozen for about, about 20 seconds, so we lost some of your audio. Okay, uh, Train, you have Lynn Tremonte as an attendee, and she's supposed to be a panelist. Oh, she's coming in. I see her as an attendee. She's oh, okay, so as soon as she's ready to go, she's going to be our first speaker, and she's from the Ohio Immigrant Alliance, and then we're going to talk about the people we're currently in sanctuary in Columbus, and then uh, on to other subject matter that could likely turn to our nuke plants and that scandal, and then uh, Greg Palace with his new book and the dilemma of our election system this year in the last hour. So welcome, and uh, <laughs> that's backwards. On the <laughs> <laughs> and let's see if we can get Lynn in here. Oh, hi, Lynn. Hi. Hi, yeah. everybody. How are you? Great. Okay. Great. Well, let's, let's talk a little bit about the Ohio Immigrant Alliance. Thank you. Um, the Ohio Immigrant Alliance is a group of immigrants and allies from around the state that works together to make the state a better place for Ohioans um, born in other countries. Um, do you want me to tell you a little bit of what we do? Well, um, I was just going to say the Free Press has been uh, reprinting a lot of the uh, information, articles, press releases that you send us, and they're usually about pretty horrendous things. So what you just said sounded very nice and <laughs> sweet, and like everything is hunky-dory, and uh, that's not really the case uh, on what's going on with uh, immigration and detention and issues in Ohio. Correct. <laughs> that, no, that's right. And well, we've been, I've been doing this for, uh, in Ohio since 2007. So we've been around for a while. Um, it's only been recently that, that things have been so bad in the last three and a half years. Um, and, you know, I just want to thank you so much for always printing our stuff, doing your own reporting. Um, the article that John wrote on Morrow County Jail was amazing. And it was really helpful to us in our advocacy. We um, have been trying to close that jail down because the, the conditions there um, are just uh, not suitable for long term detention. And because of the mismanagement there, the entire jail became COVID positive. 
I so, was, so tell us a little bit, bit exactly what's going on at that Morrow County Jail. I mean, that was yeah. a jail that had been closed down, right? Or it wasn't being uh, used as a jail, and then they started using it as a detention center for MIT. Oh, I think you're thinking of Northeast Ohio Correctional oh, Center. Okay. Yeah, that tell, happened. Tell us, tell us what's going on with these jails and, and detention centers in Ohio, sure. in case people aren't familiar with all of so um, immigrants uh, can be held in a jail for violating their visa, even though it's not a crime. It's a civil violation. It's called civil detention, but the law allows them to be held in jails uh, until they are deported. Um, sometimes that's a private prison, you know, Geocorp and um, Core Civic and, and places like that. But in Ohio, at this point, it's only county jails that are holding immigration detainees. And they, they are in the same setting as the, as the people that are there for criminal reasons. They get the same food. They actually have fewer rights um, in terms of like the visitation and um, like uh, supplies that you're allowed to send them and things like that. Um, so uh, with the Morrow County Jail, uh, Morrow County is a, you know, a very white county um, just outside of Columbus. Um, it's a very small population. And they um, decided to start to go into the immigration caging business in order to keep their jail open because they just don't have the population and the crime level to sustain a full county jail. So they've been doing this for several years, making money um, holding immigrants in this jail. Uh, but they haven't, uh, they haven't followed through on all the standards that they're supposed to to have their federal contract. Um, there's no, there's very little recreation um, opportunities. There's no doctor in the facility, um, no barber shop, things like that. And so, when um, when we, they also for a while, for all, most of the time that I've, I've been working with people there, they wouldn't even give the folks inside soap. You had to buy your own soap. So when we were hearing about, you know, how COVID was, was spreading and what was going to happen, what, you know, we saw what was going on in China and Iran and other places that had jail outbreaks. So we said, you know, Morrow County is a ticking time bomb because it's so dirty. There's no social distancing possible. Everybody's in one big room and um, they just don't care. And so we knew this was going to happen. And then within just a few um, weeks, about early May, was was when the situation blew up there they they tested um they got to the point where about 60 percent of the people in the jail were tested positive and then they stopped testing them and they also stopped isolating people so the assumption that they made was that everybody was exposed and, and infected so um but the county commissioners and health department were trying to be evasive and say that, that they're not 100% COVID positive, but that was only because they stopped testing. So they can't claim some other number. And that was one of the things that the Columbus Free Press um, was helping expose. So I'm gonna interrupt just for a second and ask Train, did you remember to hit the record button? Oh yeah, oh yes, of course. <laughs> okay, good. Um, Thanks for asking. <laughs> right. You know, you know me. I'm I'm like logistics woman. I, I should also, since you asked, I just also shared this live on Facebook. Ah, excellent. So Yay. the freepress.org cool. website. Uh, I'm sorry, the freepress.org Facebook page uh, has an embed now of this conversation. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, so t uh, the reason Bob's out of the picture is because he's dealing with Greg Pallast and Harvey, who are going to come in later. So, um, so Lynn, in regards to what the Ohio Immigrant Alliance can do in a situation like that, I mean, here's like hundreds of people in this detention center. Is there anything that an organization like yours can do, or do, do you work more like with individual people and families that are, that are suffering? We do both, and in the Murrow County campaign is a great example because it started out working with individuals on their cases and that's how we learned all this information about how dirty the jail was and how poorly run um, and then we used that information to create an advocacy campaign so we and we had people from all across the state 
participating in it. So we were making calls to the commissioners, um, calling the health department. We uh, attended the health, de health department meeting that was held on Zoom, and we basically kind of shut it down. I mean, um, because they weren't, they weren't taking our, con our concerns seriously. They were telling us that our facts were wrong. Um, and so we were, we, um, everybody had changed their picture, their profile picture to the pit photo of a man who had died after contracting COVID in the Morrow County Jail, Oscar Lopez. Um, and then we were chatting, you know, sending messages in the chat. Um, and it was just, it was kind of chaotic, but you know, it w we made our point, which is that we want to be heard. You're not taking us seriously. And so the next month when they had another meeting and we were there in person, they were better prepared. And there, there had been, um, a few improvements that were made to the jail at, um, in between that time period. So do you think that this situation is just going to continue on just like indefinitely or is it a thing that's just in the Trump administration? Oh. Um, do you mean about deportations in general or do you mean about the Morrow County? Morrow County, the Ohio okay. detention centers and things that are happening. Yeah, right. I mean, you know, to be honest, uh, Obama actually deported a lot of people too. He deported 2 million people was the record. Um, and immigration detention ballooned uh, under his administration as well. Um, so it's not like it's going to be a cakewalk, but the Trump administration is so different. They have changed so many things um, on immigration policy in such a very short time period. And what they've been deporting people who uh, previous administrations had given the right to stay and a work permit. Um, they just want to get rid of as many people as possible. So uh, it will it will change if there's a new president. Um, I think the detention issue specifically is going to take a lot of work, though, because um, the system is built and there's a lot of people making money off of it, whether you're a private prison or you're a county. Yeah, this is a depressing situation. Um, do we have any, I mean, we have huge, huge hopes that he will not be our president anymore after this. Do we have any idea what, what Joe Biden, I mean, after him working under Obama, we know he went along with that. Do we have any idea what to expect under him or what any of our Ohio legislators feel about this? Yes, we do know. We've seen the draft platform for the Democratic Party um, it built off of the Biden-Sanders Unity Task Force recommendations. And there's a lot of good stuff in it. Um, it does include uh, changing the immigration court system so that it is actually a real court, an Article Three independent court, rather than basically a second prosecution, prosecuting agency, which it is now. Uh, it's, it's a political agency. It's under the Justice Department. Um, and they do include um, just a halt to deportations until for, I think, 100 days. Um, I believe that's in there um, to figure out what's going on and just, you know, like, don't keep implementing the Trump policies, you know, on day one. So, so they repeal a lot of the things that Trump has done. Um, one issue that I'm really interested in seeing more from, from Biden on is about the right to return after deportation. Um, like I said, many people that Trump deported have um, were here for decades, had work permits, um, paid taxes, owned homes and businesses, and they have family here. And, you know, now they're all over the world, um, but their family still misses them and they still miss their lives here. So there are pieces in the law where they could come back in uh, and then eventually if they have access to a green card, either through their marriage or through... Um, immigration reform, then they could get a green card that way, but they would be here back in the status that they were before. So I'm interested in him um, really embracing that because I think part of this country needs a lot of healing. Um, and part of that healing has to be reuniting families torn apart by deportation. Is there anything that your group does in regards to that? I mean, I know you may be lobby people, but is there any other like on the ground work that you do? Yeah, I mean, I, I do work with a lot of lawyers um, and immigrants on their cases. So I help out, um, you know, with just sort of 
information sharing and, and anything that's needed. So I do work with a lot of people that were deported. And um, for example, we did a campaign to uh, try to get this inserted into the platform. And so several people who were deported allowed me to use the pictures of them in the campaign. Um, and we're also doing, you know, media education, like education through the media, um, because this is an issue that you don't hear about very much. And so we're at the very beginning stages of, of the campaign. Um, and just to try to get it into um, allies, so that allies learn about it first. Um, and then when there's more favorable conditions, we can do the real advocacy uh, to make it happen. Is, are there any specific cases that we need to know about right now that maybe we could be helping, uh, helping with the advocacy? Um, there's, there are specific cases, uh, many from Ohio, um, but there's nothing that I can think of other than advocating with any, well, yeah, with any member of the Democratic Party or delegates to the convention, anybody that you may know who has a, who could influence their decision. Uh, I know the platform's pretty much drafted. Um, I, I'm hoping that they're going to include this little piece, um, but I'm going to actually put something on my website on Monday, ohioimmigrant.org, about a recent op-ed that we had placed in Daily Coast on this topic. So there I'll include some action items for people too. Thank you for asking. Could well, I mention I'm one more thing? Oh, you're not done yet, but yeah, go ahead. Okay. Sure. Well, I just, I, back on the Morrow County stuff, um, I was talking about our advocacy, but what I didn't talk about, which was hugely important, was the ACLU of Ohio. They filed a lawsuit um, challenging the detention of immigrants in the jail there, um, you know, because of people that had uh, medical problems that made them higher risk for death if they contracted COVID. And um, through the ACLU of Ohio lawsuit, not only were uh, about a dozen people released from Morrow County Jail, um, but also they got a lot of great information um, about what specific conditions at the jail, and they got it on the record. And the judge, her name is Sarah D. Morrison, she's a Trump appointee, she was appalled at what she heard and what she saw. And, and, the, and the ICE defense was extremely weak. They didn't even have anybody testify who'd actually been in the jail in recent, in recent months. So um, her order is, if you like to read stuff like that, it's really compelling. It's also posted on my website and I also pulled out some of the excerpts that are the, the, the hottest ones too. Uh, was uh, Morrill County the one where they had a broad open space and there was no way uh, to really keep people who were infected from each other? Essentially, uh, uh, it was a large petri dish with no uh, way to isolate the uh, detainees? Yes, that's correct. Exactly. It, it, and it's, go ahead. Oh, it's still like that. And they, they're still taking in new people. They're not taking in new immigrants because they're not allowed to because of the ACLU of Ohio lawsuit. But, um, but they're still taking in people from the county. And they still, since there's no isolation rooms, what they do is they, they have a quarantine room and they put everybody who's new in that one room. Mm -hmm. So you, if you've been in the jail for 13 days, you're being mixed in with the guy who just is coming in today. That's their isolation, yeah. you know? So it's like, uh, it's going to happen again. You know, it's, it's just a matter of time. Yeah, I had a case out there in, uh, with the judge who was really freaking out about the uh, people over at the uh, jail in uh, general, Judge uh, Hickson. And uh, in, in his court, he had us all like farther, far away as possible. <laughs> he was so afraid uh, that he might be catching it from the uh, ICE location. Yeah. Something occurred to me while you were talking is that abolish ICE is something that like we all would hope to happen. Do we have any idea if that's gonna continue if we get a new administration? Yes, I mean, we have to abolish ICE. We have to start at the top. Um, for Ohio, that means getting rid of our district director. She's in Detroit. Her name's Rebecca Aducci. She is a monster. 
she makes the most um, cruel and heartless decisions. She tried to deport a, a man who is deaf and has Down syndrome. You know, uh, Fortunately, a member of Congress was able to stop that, but she has made so many horrible choices. So yes, we need—we actually need to get rid of all the people that were there. If they're gonna, if they're gonna keep the agency, um, they need all new people, and um, and their mission needs to change too. I mean, their mission right now is that they're kind of like, like they're playing cops and robbers with, uh, but they're using real guns, and they, um, you know, they they get. They get so much satisfaction out of hunting humans. And so that's not, they lie constantly. They, they change paperwork. They um, cheat. They do everything they can to just hunt down immigrants and put them in a cage. So yeah, the people need to completely, leadership needs to go. The mission needs to change. Um, and, and, the, and the agency needs to have its budget dramatically cut. And that goes along with the need to, to end immigration detention. It doesn't make any sense that you're putting somebody in jail for a civil offense and keeping them there forever. I have a friend who's going on two years now in immigration detention. So I'm going to interrupt to have Train tell the audience how they can ask questions. Train, are you there to do that? Here? Sorry, right. yeah, it was muted. There. Okay, uh, one moment. Howdy, folks. Uh, I think you guys can probably see me. Let me make sure you can. There I am. There you okay. are. So uh, this format is, a, is called a webinar. It's slightly different than our standard Cyber Saturdays. This time, because it got a little chaotic uh, while I was gone, so we're going to institute a, a few controls. So those of you who've joined and have noticed that your microphone isn't working, nobody can hear you talking, uh, don't panic, don't freak out. I think there was a, a notice that popped up that informed you that in a webinar, the panelists that are right up there, I think, for most people's view, uh, they have uh, their cameras and audio turned on automatically. And all of the attendees, the regular folks, uh, your mics are muted. Uh, and your cameras are, are turned off. However, once the panelists have uh, conducted their uh, presentations, um, we'll be able to turn everybody's cameras on and everybody can socialize. But if you have a question, there's two ways you can raise that question. First, down, I think on that side, uh, depends, I think my camera's flipped. Down yeah. below, there's a little raise your hand button. It's also in the chat oh. window. Can you? What were you going to say, Suzanne? Oh, I don't have the raise hand because I'm a panelist. Never mind. Right. None of the panelists have a raise hand, but all the attendees do. And so when you do, on my window on the side here, uh, a little blurb pops up and it says, who has raised their hand? In fact, let me see who's currently raising their hand. Nobody's raised their hand. <laughs> so it's all right. That, oh, thank you very much, Mark Stansbury, Harvey Wasserman. Hey, you're not supposed to be an attendee. Let's promote you. You're now in a, inside the panelists. So that's, thank you, Charles. You're lowering your hands. All righty, folks. I, so I'm I gonna turn it over. Oh, go ahead, Tim. Yeah, I got a question for uh, Lynn. Lynn, um, in Morrow uh, County, are they accepting prisoners for, high, for, for cash? I mean, uh, they room prisoners? Yes, yep. they do. And what are those prisoners coming from? I mean, uh, that they're rooming that uh, apparently I guess there's uh, jails that can't take them or decided not to take them. Just... No, it's uh, it's people that are arrested in the county. I think that they might actually hold people for a couple different counties, um, very small population counties. And then it's the immigrants that are federal detainees. And those are the people that they get paid for by the federal government. Okay, they get paid for by the federal government. Are Columbus uh, police involved at all in uh, uh, with any uh, immigrants uh, being detained? Um, I don't know of any examples of that. Um, is, is there any contracting with um, uh, um, uh, Franklin County and no. Morrow County? Okay. No. All right. No. Yeah. 
because it seems that'd be a good way to fight it is that uh, if um, if a municipality was uh, contracted with that jail is that you'd approach your municipality and say hey Lex this is not right that you're sending these people there you know well we can still do that though and actually Liz Brown sent a letter to the commissioners and to the county health board um, because they're they're still Columbus constituents in the jail I mean, Columbus residents, you know what I mean? Because of right. the ice, the ice people. So that's a really good tactic. Um, we haven't gotten that many letters or pressure from other um, elected officials, but we could use more. That would be really helpful. And as individuals, we could send letters that would um, ask them specifically, what would we ask them? Uh, um, just to close the jail because they, um, they can't, they can't handle it during COVID. They've yeah. proven that they can't handle it. A second ask, a secondary ask or a lesser ask would be to cancel the ICE contract. Okay. So what we do, Lynn, after every salon is we send everybody an email with a list of, you know, what we could do to help your group. So maybe you could email that to me when we're done or tomorrow yeah. or something with the very specifics about what you want people to do. Um, okay. Mark Stansberry had questions. He's been typing them up, but I think Train, you could probably unmute Mark so that he can ask them yep. Mark, Mark has, uh, audio there he is go ahead mark you should be able to talk mute myself there you go okay thank you hey lynn this uh hey. mark is great i uh, met you electronically when we were setting up that other thing um my questions access points you were going to put some some things down the road access points for action in the next two months in your agenda what what do you yeah. think? what do you think um contacting the county commissioners at morrow county and telling them to close yeah. the jail or cancel the contract yeah. would be one contract with ice yes yeah yeah, yeah. and the con and close the jail or end the contract with ice yeah. um if you know anybody going to the democratic convention talking to them about that it's not enough to just change deportations for the future. We also need to make the families that were torn apart whole and let people come back into the country and that there are things that the administration can do. It doesn't just need to be up to Congress on that. Mm -hmm. um, and let's see what else. Um, we are, we're hosting a panel with um, Ohio Supreme Court justices, um, a couple candidates on the 12th. So if people are interested in attending that and um, hearing from them and getting to ask them some questions, that's something that people can do to get up to speed on the Supreme Court candidates. Um, we are going to have an event um, that's featuring videos of, well, it's related to the, uh, um, the treatment of children who are in detention. Um, so it's gonna be a video, um, showing short videos and it's going to be interactive that that will be this fall um so if people want to get ongoing information like that they should join my email list on ohioimmigrant.org and or join our facebook group which is ohio immigrant alliance there's a public page and then there's a private page so click on the private page and request to join and then i'll admit you we like to keep it a private page so that we can use it for discussions and organizing um, and strategy. So Lynn, so, we're gonna keep, oh, did you have more, Mark? No, that's great, thank you. Thank you very much, I was just saying thank you. But CPD did pick up some parents from Hubbard on ICE orders, Hubbard Elementary oh, in Columbus. And I know other elementary oh, schools wow. that had that happen. So it, oh is, it, is, it is going on. Just, you were, you were asked that question. Yeah, yeah, thank you. I know what happened, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh. That's, That's awful. Terrible. So we're going to keep Lynn on, but we're going to bring John Grinstead and Sally Padgett in, who have been working in the sanctuary move movement right here in Columbus. So I don't know if both of you can uh, take turns talking, and if Lynn, you need to add anything in this whole section, we can just have the rest of this the hour discussing these type of issues. So I don't know, John, Sally. I'll let Reverend uh, <laughs> Reverend Padgett go first. I think she's. Uh, She's really been the closest and doing the, the, the best work of our group. Absolutely. Um, well, is there anything specific you'd like me to kind of talk about? 
Well, what we had advertised is that we were going to have Miriam on because Tim right. thought maybe Miriam would be able to join us. But for those people that may not know who Mir Miriam is or her situation, you could give us a little summary and then bring us up to speed as to the situation now, I guess. Okay. Um, Miriam is um, a wonderful person. Uh, she has been at First English Lutheran Church on the Near East Side for uh, over okay years now. Um, she came in because she had a deportation order, but she also is the mother of two children and one who has special needs. And so the thought of leaving her uh, children, her options, I say it basically said, you can take your children back to Honduras with you. And the idea of taking two young, two young girls back to a um, country that's one of the most dangerous countries in the world doesn't really seem like an option. And the other kind of option was that she goes back and then they said, well, you can put your children up for adoption, um, you know, which wasn't real kind either. So two years ago, Miriam moved in. Um, she's been there, living there with her two girls, like I said, for almost two years. Um, you know, she, like I said, she is just, all she wants to do is be a mother. That's all she wants to do. She's, you know, she's not a criminal. She's not a lawbreaker. She was living her life. Um, you know, the government allowed her to stay, you know, under the Obama administration. Um, and they would say, okay, you can stay for a year and just check in. So she, she's been in this country for 13 years, uh, paying her taxes, working, um, being a law abiding citizen, um, as, you know, as well as she could. And, um, you know, with Trump's administration, he came in and like uh, Lynn had said, they just kind of want to get rid of people. So um, they basically told her, you have to buy a plane ticket and leave the country. And so her only option was sanctuary. And we all know that sanctuary is not an ideal situation. We've all been living with these COVID, um, you know, staying in place uh, with COVID. And so, you know, we can at least still go for a walk outside or you know, go to the grocery store. Miriam can't do any of that. So we're kind of getting an idea. Could you imagine doing what we're doing now for two years? The other issue that came up was um, when COVID came out at the beginning, we believe Miriam had COVID and, um, you know, she had to suffer, you know, alone basically in a church, um, you know, no, no hospitalization, no doctors, um, you know, you can do a televisit, but what can you really do by a televisit? And so we did a stay of, deport, a stay of deportation order for Miriam. However, that um, ICE returned it saying she was a fugitive and therefore they weren't even going to look at it or consider it. Um, so that did not go anywhere. And she's also been su suffering, you can imagine from the stress. She had an episode with Bell's palsy, um, didn't know if it was a stroke. But again, when you have, um, when you're staying in sanctuary, just you know, things like going to the doctor, uh, going to the dentist, going to the eye doctor, getting, you know, getting glasses or whatever, all these things become nearly impossible. Um, you know, how do you go and get treatment for, um, to go see a physical therapist? You can't. You know, there's a whole lot of things that Miriam just cannot do um, that are necessary for her own health and well-being, and um, she's being denied that right now. And so I skipped over Tim Chavez here, uh, who's uh, one of our Free Press board members. Tim, did you want to jump in and uh, explain a little bit about you, how you're involved? And, and I also didn't introduce you, Sally, as being the pastor of First English Lutheran Church, and which is why you have all this intimate knowledge of Miriam. But thank you so much, and thank the people at the church for, for offering that sanctuary. So go uh, ahead. Thank you. Thank you, Suzanne. Yeah, I'm a member of, of Team Miriam, and so is Lindsay, who's on the panel, and John, and of course, Sally. Mm -hmm. And uh, what I just got to say is that, you know, the sanctuary movement really uh, started here in the United States in the 1980s when we had our wars in uh, Central America. And uh, contrary to that, what was happening there is that uh, there was a leftist uh, a movement, a progressive movement within uh, Central America so, through elections and started wars as uh, people trying to uh, circumvent that. And who you had was a little bit like Cuba is where the people that were oppressing the people had to leave the country. So they, a lot of people um, uh, 
uh, came over as from the right wing, but also from the just people that were victims of the wars in Central America in the 1980s um, came over to the United States just seeking some peace. So um, this uh, 2007, um, this, you know, that uh, is when the sanctuary movement started here in the United States because of the real heavy uh, deportation um, laws that were uh, cracking the whip on the people and actually deporting a lot of people, which uh, like was said, uh, Lynn said, is that Obama deported a lot of people uh, during his tenure, just so uh, it was ignored for some reason or another. So um, really, you know, sanctuary is, um, like Ruben Castilla Herrera said, he's the one that introduced me uh, to uh, Sally and to uh, Miriam. Uh, he said, you know, uh, sanctuary uh, is, um, is not really the answer, but it's, it's a process. And it's a process of hope. And, uh, and it's, it gives you some footing to, in order to make your decisions later. So uh, with Miriam, we're pushing for the election uh, we're pushing to get some sane policy within uh, our federal government, and that would direct the state and local governments also. So that's that's our goal here. Miriam is a very brave woman. She fights very hard for what she believes in. It's family. So, and John's been great. John uh, has been a great interpreter. He's very, been very very close through. Why don't you tell us something about yourself, John? Well, I got started working in a Central American Refugee Center in uh, Southern California exactly in the 1980s, and like you were talking about, because beginning in the early 80s, ending the end of the, the 80s, you sort of had uh, this 10-year um, U.S. war, proxy war of, of different types that ended up, uh, you know, killing tens of thousands of people and basically making countries where people wanted to stay and wanted to live like in their own homes unlivable. And so they had to leave. And so in Southern California, where I grew up, there were uh, 500,000 uh, people from just from El Salvador. And I always understood why there were people from Mexico in Southern California, because it used to be Mexico. But I'd never understood the Central American thing as a tenant as a teenager. And so little by little, it kind of dawned on me what what, what was going on. And so I got involved um, working as an interpreter doing political asylum cases. And um, so I just kind of naturally gravitated back to it when under the Obama administration, the US again started meddling in Central American policy, uh, politics in particular. I mean, they never really stopped, but the election of Hernandez um, when Celaya had been, had been elected, um, the sort of, you know, a coup essentially um, perpetrated there just made things worse, less stable. So you had more people exiting Central America, um, and and Miriam and and the other asylees around the country because she's she and Edith um, Espinal are 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 the two that we have here. But in, around the country, there are hundreds of people who are in this position. Represent something. They represent uh, the principle of political asylum that came out of experience in World War II. Um, where people were fleeing the Nazis and they were turned away. They weren't given um, refuge. They weren't treated as uh, asylees, as refugees who had a certain status, you know, by law. And that was a really important principle for us to institute. So nothing like what happened in, in the Second World War would happen again. My mother actually worked for an organization called UNRWA, which after the Second World War uh, helped people who were in um, the concentration camps who survived get back to the different places that they'd been taken from. And um, that was drilled into me as a, as a young person that that's a principle that you stand up for. So Miriam's um, is a symbol. She's also a delightful human being, as several of you have remarked. So it's, it's really no work at all um, to try to help her. But she represents something much bigger than that, which is that we should be standing up for this for other people, even people who aren't delightful, still have a right to have a decent life. And um, they have a right, if they have a well-founded fear of persecution, if they are returned to their country, to stay right where they are. And um, that is a principle that we need to uphold and that I've been grateful for the opportunity to help in promoting through through Team Miriam. What do you got to say, Lindsay? I don't 
don't have a whole lot to add. You guys have been very comprehensive, but I will echo that Miriam is a saint. She's an angel and she doesn't deserve this and neither does anybody else at all. So I just think it's really important that um, she just continues to feel our love and support every day and that we really get this, uh, this legislation going and get this change of the guard going here in the fall and move things in the right direction. <laughs> Hey, I had a question. Um, I, we, I was talking to John earlier saying that, yeah, we had met him before and we met Miriam because this church was holding dinners and fundraisers. And now that we're not all getting together and closed spaces with each other anymore, I suppose some of that fundraising and some of that camaraderie has really gone. I mean, it's just gone now. And I don't know if there's any way for people to still get involved. And I was just showing, um, trying to hold this up to my my uh, camera here there are these stickers that people can put on the back of their phones or whatever they want it says citizen Miriam if you can't read it backwards and we have a sign uh, a yard sign in our front yard um, that has Miriam's face on it but is there anything else happening that other that people can do to support Miriam and or Edith that you know of we always have different fundraisers I think the next one coming up is the virtual race is that correct, guys? Remind me. But I think on her 800th day in um, sanctuary this fall, um, people can always also donate. We have a Tithely account. So if you go download the Tithely app and go to First English Lutheran Church and then uh, click on sanctuary, you can um, donate that way. Um, also, we have a GoFundMe page um, that people can donate to. But you know, it takes a lot to keep um, Miriam and her girls, um, you know, they have to eat, they have to, you know, have products, you know, you know, cleaning products and hygiene products. And, you know, there's a lot of things that go into um, keeping Miriam there. So um, any donations we appreciate. And uh, just also look on Miriam Sanctuary is her Facebook account, I think. Is that correct, Lindsay? Miriam in Sanctuary. Yeah, Miriam in Sanctuary. I'm not on Facebook, so. <laughs> so yeah, like her on Facebook and just keep up with her and what she's been doing um, and what's coming up. It is a lot harder when we're having to deal remote. Um, you know, we're not, people aren't at the church as much. It's, you know, it's, it's, I think it's isolated Miriam a lot more. She feels a lot more isolated. She doesn't have people coming. Um, you know, we used to be there on a, at least a weekly basis. You know, the whole team would be there and uh, to support her. And now it's it's a little it's a lot more difficult. So COVID has definitely made things a lot more difficult um, for Miriam and for Edith and for everybody living in sanctuary. Yeah, there's a little bit of action that uh, we could also another actions that that are mentioned on her uh, website too. It's uh, citizenmiriam.org. And uh, you just tap into that, that'd be a lot of help. But really uh, that is a good one because uh, that's where you could write, uh, just get something that if you uh, can't afford to donate anything, you could donate your time by writing letters of support because we want to get as much letter of support for Miriam because her day is going to come. She's, she's, she's on her way to her citizenship we just need to get past this little hump here i have a question here of how old are miriam's daughters or children they're 10 and 6. 10 and 6 yes yeah. and is it best for people to give you money or to give you actual items that that they need um it's best to either give money or gift cards uh, you know she has a special needs daughter and so you know buying specific things when you have a special needs child they don't all you know it's not one size kind of fits all she has certain things that she likes and doesn't like i doesn't Lin like so we but Lindsay um L Lindsay just put the GoFundMe link in the chat right in the chat for you guys Great. yeah yeah so um I would say it's best to donate money or gift cards and you can mail gift cards to um the church with attention Miriam on it it's at 1015 East Main Street, and it's in Columbus, 43205. Um, 
So we can also take gift card donations to like Kroger's or Amazon where she can, um, you know, buy the things she needs. She has people, we'll go shopping for her. She can order things online and we can pick things up from Kroger. So that works out too. So, um, um, when, when Miriam, when, when sometimes people hear about what, what happens with Miriam and Edith being in sanctuary and that they might, I mean, there's no way that ICE can come into a church. Do you want to explain that situation about why a church? Um, yeah, they actually, they actually can if they really wanted to. If the church was open, you know, they could actually come in if they wanted to. They choose not to. There's four sensitive locations that ICE typically respects. Um, in that schools and hospitals and rallies and then churches. But they have been known under this administration, the Trump administration, to go into hospitals and schools. So technically, if they came to the door, they would have to have a warrant if the door is locked. But, you know, if the church is open, you know, they can come in as anyone. So she has to be behind locked doors in order to be safe. And that, again, that, that's basically like being in jail. John, John or Lynn, uh, did you have anything to add to this conversation? No, I just, um, I've, I've met Miriam before and she showed me around her, her apartment or her area. And um, I just was struck by how welcoming she was. Um, and I can imagine it must be really hard to live, um, you know, inside of uh, an enclosed space for so long, but uh, the Columbus folks have just really done a great job um, in, in helping her and taking care of her. So thanks, guys. Well, on behalf of Team Miriam, I would like to express our gratitude to the uh, Free Press for giving us an opportunity to talk a little bit about our situation and also to express our gratitude to Lynn Tremonte for the amazing work that she and her organization does. We're very happy that you continue to do what you do. You have our moral, if not immediate, financial backing. And, uh, <laughs> Absolutely. And keep, keep up the great work. Thank yes, you. thank you, Lynn. Does anybody have any questions? Raise, uh, if you heard how train, to raise your hands. Maybe you could raise your hands if you have any questions. Mm -hmm. uh, I just had one uh, historical uh, comment. Uh, that uh, a lot of you talked about the instability in, in the region, uh, but in Columbus, Ohio, Southern Air Transport, formerly Air America, was literally brought to the capital, to Rickenbacker, with state money uh, and brought by a man named Jeffrey Epstein, who was working for Les Wexner at the time. So uh, it's ironic because of essentially U.S. foreign policy in that region is why many of those countries are so economically destabilized to this day. And some of the people involved in that uh, you know, uh, weren't of the uh, best citizenship quality. And if I can say too, Miriam actually does have a very good case. We've had lawyers look at her case. The issue was is, you know, our country didn't get back to her for four years after she filled out asylum paperwork and they mailed it to her original address, knowing that she probably moved. You know, um, she had had change of address forms on file, but they mailed them to her original address. Um, you know, and so if she had been able to have her day in court, there's a good chance that she would not be in sanctuary right now. But because of, you know, the fact that after, it took them four years to get back to her and, um, well, she would at least have had the opportunity to present her case. As Lynn was commenting earlier, there are changes that have to be made in the nature of immigration courts. So they're not simply political fora where you come in and you say, I would like political asylum. And their first question is, where are you from? And when you say Central America, you know, forget it. Whereas if you're from an official enemy of the United States, then, you know, it's a completely different matter, which has always been our, you know, our, our worry with Miriam's case is that, you know, this is one of these uh, sort of authoritarian situations the United States backs. And so naturally, we're not going to, we're not going to grant asylum to people that come from there like we didn't in the 80s and we're not now.
Right. And Miriam, like uh, you've, you've said, everybody said that she does have an extremely good case. And uh, she, there's no threat of her like running anywhere. I mean, she's actually running inside right now just to keep the uh, ice from uh, coming and deporting her. Uh, she um, uh, is, she is uh, an extremely peaceful person. Uh, she is, functions very well. She was working when uh, she went into asylum and she was paying taxes she was a good consumer, just like everybody else. And there's absolutely no reason that they had to disrupt her family this way, because uh, uh, there's absolutely no reason that she had to prevent them from disrupting the, her family the way they wanted to disrupt her family, which is basically to separate her from her children or send her with the children to a country that they know nothing about. I don't think it was mentioned in this, um, panel yet but uh miriam's children are americans they're american yeah, citizens yeah. and uh there's no reason for them to ever go back and there's no reason for them to ever go it's not even going back there's no reason for them to leave the country to honduras and there's no reason for miriam to leave the country and leave her children here in the united states she's no risk at all and that's the same situation with edith i presume yes edith espinal Great. So each is at the, uh, um, no, what is that, the uh, Methodist the, the, the Columbus Mennonite Church. Mennonite Church. I mean, I'd go even further than that, and I would say it's not just that they weren't doing anything bad here. It's that they are enriching our country. They're, they're genuinely good human beings, both of them. And that's not always the case. It's not always something you can say about people, you know, who come here. Um, but but these two people were really good people and, and both had very strong motivations, good, reasonable motivations, which if they were ever given a, f a fair hearing by a fair process, uh, would be granted asylum, like just under sort of standard assumptions, right? Um, it's unfortunately not the way the system works under Trump and it wasn't you know, awesome under Obama either. Um, but it should be, it should be, it should be fair. And, and there needs to be a special category for people who ask for political asylum and, and their, their evidence and their, their arguments need to be taken seriously. Somebody's asking, or it's Mark Stansbury asking, how much is the Lutheran Church supporting sanctuary? And I think he means the overall, overarching Lutheran Church. Yeah, the, the last year, uh, last summer in June at their um, churchwide assembly, the Lutheran, ELCA Lutheran Church declared themselves a sanctuary denomination. It was, they were the first ones to do that. Um, so actually, they are, you know, we were on task force there too to figure out exactly what that means. And they don't mean just people in sanctuary. They do have, pe they have about eight, the Lutheran Church has about eight people in sanctuary across the country. But it also means accompanying any immigrants on their journey while they're here in the United States and also those deported. They try to, you know, if people are deported, they're trying to meet them also and, and make sure that they can adjust back to their life uh, there. But yes, the ELCA is a sanctuary denomination that strongly says this is wrong, that this is not something that um, anybody who declares themselves to be a Christian should be in support of, you know, or should be in support of. But, Deportation is not anything that um, that goes along with our faith. So, yeah, Pastor Sally puts her money where her mouth is, and that's again something you can't say about um, every pastor of every denomination. Um, as a proud atheist, <laughs> <laughs> Pastor Sally is uh, is very is very convincing. Somebody's writing here that they, they, their cousin was deported by ICE in 2009 or 2010. He had overstayed an employment visa. So this is really something that's like touching a lot of our lives and it just makes us feel so helpless. You know, it's just- Well, and again, everybody says it, says it and it sounds cliche, but we are a nation of immigrants. You know, unless you're Native American, you are, from, you are an immigrant, you know, you came here as an immigrant, um, or at least your family, somewhere in your family they did. And so, again, to all of a sudden change our policy to this, you know, really strict 
you know, no immigrants allowed. But the reality is too, if you are from Scandinavia and you have blonde hair and blue eyes and a lot of money, you can become a citizen within four years. You know, but if you're from the Philippines or Central America or Mexico, it takes over 20 if you're even allowed. So again, the injustice in our system is just, it, it has, we have to work for ju a just system that actually gives people a fair chance to come here and uh, work hard and better their lives. We could also take more seriously stopping destabilizing other people's <laughs> societies such that they have to leave in the first place. Um, people basically don't want to leave. It's a, it's a really uh, scarring, traumatic mm -hmm. experience to, to leave the place that you know, the people that you know, the institutions, the structures, the customs, the language. You got to throw that all out the window and go be a second language speaker the rest of your life as an adult, which doesn't usually work out that well. Um, so it takes a tremendous amount of bravery um, to be you know, somebody who's willing to you know, pick up roots and, and leave like that. And so, you know, maybe we could make it so people's countries weren't so desperation inducing that they had to leave. And the United States bears a substantial burden. It bears uh, a substantial blame, blame for uh, the, the problems that exist politically and economically in Central America. And it could be doing things to remedy them. Basically, massive reparations to try to sort of put things right. That could be done. We have the money. We have the moral obligation. So, you know, people want to complain about all the immigrants coming here seeking, you know, political asylum. Okay, maybe, uh, maybe see if you can change the policies that, that create these horror shows to start with. And that could be another salon. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. Do we have any more comments? We got Victoria. Uh, I don't know if you want to say what you're writing there, Victoria. Did you want to come on and speak? Victoria Khan. I don't know, Train, if you need to unmute her. I just did. Go ahead, Victoria. Hi, can you hear me? Yeah. Um, yeah, I, um, I met a man online back in 2003 married him in 2004, uh, made arrangements to go to Pakistan to actually meet him. And of course, one of the very first things we did was go to the embassy and apply for um, immigration for him to come back to the US with me once I got there. And the first thing I was told was that I had to live there for six months, as in live in Pakistan for six months. I had no idea about that when I went there. <laughs> and so that's the first thing I did was I, I ended up living in Pakistan. I didn't, I actually lived, li lived there for two full years and that included living in the um, Northwest Frontier Province, which is the tribal region and right near the Afghan border. And it was quite interesting living with the giant family system and all of that. And it was right before the United States in 2006 went in to eradicate the Taliban there in the Swat Valley, which is where I was, that I was able to get on a plane and get back into the US. Um, and at that point, uh, the first thing I had to do was go stand inside in front of a federal building and hold up a newspaper and point to the date and prove to the United States that I was back here in the country because of course they said we can't immigrate a man if you're not in the country. So, and then he was able to come in within six months after that. He originally came in on a, on a uh, I can't remember if it was I forget how many years it was the original green card, but it was but it was an instantly right away turned into a ten year green card, and then he then we went for the citizenship, and of course came to Columbus and he took the oath and all of that and there and then he actually got his citizenship, um, but it was quite an ordeal just uh, the legalities of the whole thing um, even if you do it the right way. So and not very many of us have had like firsthand experience trying to either immigrate somewhere else or 
help somebody immigrate here. So yeah, it's interesting to find out what all the what all those details. I are. will say that. Um, believe it or not, Governor DeWine, and at the time, uh, Senator, um, in a sense, he helped put a fire under the embassy's butt, if you will, there in Islamabad. We spent, oh, you wouldn't believe how many trips we took to the embassy in Islamabad, and, and you know, doing this and doing that, filing this, and they, and of course, it was quite interesting. I mean, when you get down to the real details, it was quite interesting um, the questions we were asked by the immigration officers, um, you know, the, the whole ordeal was quite interesting. Let's just put it that way. But, um, uh, it went off really without a hitch. And I've been told that no one has ever immigrated uh, or no one has ever immigrated from Pakistan as quickly as I got this, got this done. Um, the, uh, the senator's office actually called to Pakistan twice just to even, you know, he had a lawyer from his office call where I was staying two different times within that two year period, uh, just to, you know, see how things were going and, 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 and to keep abreast of, of what was going on because, because I had alerted them, you know, that I was there and that maybe I might need help uh, getting this done. Thanks for your comments, Victoria. We are getting ready to shift gears for a second hour here. Um, but at the end, I don't know if everybody told me or everybody heard me say earlier that if people have information that they want me to send out in the follow-up email to everybody from the salon, which could include what events are coming up with for Miriam and how people can give, um, I'll go through the chat and I'll take out the links that people have sent. But if you have anything else you want me to send about what's going on with uh, the Ohio Immigrant Alliance or Miriam or Edith's situation, I can send all that out in a big email at the end, oh, not, not today, maybe <laughs> tomorrow or the next day when we get the, the video. We also send everybody a copy of, of the video as well and we put it out there for people to, to watch after the fact, especially if they missed it. But thank you everybody. If you have any thank you. Uh, thank you. If you have any final comments, please go ahead and we are expecting um, Harvey and Bob and Greg to talk with us for the second half hour. Thank you. Thanks so much we, uh, for supporting uh, Team Miriam and Miriam uh, Vasquez. Uh, it's a it's it's a good follow. That's for sure. Thank you. Thanks, guys. I sent you over some action items that I typed up while we were talking. So, thank you so much. Excellent. Thank you. Hey, here. All right. Turning it over to Harvey and Bob. Let's, uh, can we do the uh, wind thing first? Sure. Absolutely, Tell Greg gets here, go ahead. Okay, so hi everybody, I'm Sluggo here with Bob Trakis. Um, and um, we have a major opportunity in Ohio like we haven't had before. Tim Chavez was in our other call and made a great suggestion. Um, the, um, the bribery scandal, <laughs> who can make this up $60 million, <laughs> God, uh, to uh, uh, what's his name, Larry Householder. We just call him Larry House. Um, his, uh, has really uh, indicated that they will probably overturn or rescind the billion dollar bailout, HB6, but then they're gonna wanna turn right around and, and put it back in, in some other form. Now, in the middle of all, all this, um, we do have, I, I, I see we're joined with Greg Powis. Um, hey. Greg, we're gonna, you actually are an expert on wind and, and um, nuclear power as well. So we just- and, and, and Ohio's nuclear system, because yeah. I was an advisor to Governor Dick Celeste of Ohio, and I was a overpaid consultant to the Ohio <laughs> Public Service Commission dealing with the, with overcharging you for the nuclear plants. Uh, right, so they're nuclear. trying to do that again. And um, we have this opportunity, Greg, I know in your career, you've never encountered any public officials taking bribe monies, uh, but uh, the, the, the Speaker of the House of Ohio took $60 million to- Well, but then he's a schmuck because he doesn't understand that what he did for them was worth billions. So, I mean, when I was work, you know, when I was investigating, for example, uh, the, the same companies that were bribing American officials for peanuts, are paying two and three hundred million dollar bribes, for example, to the uh, president of Kazakhstan. Uh, right. So, 
you know, it, Americans are cheap. Campaign. What I found out doing corruption investigations is Americans are pretty cheap. Though the cheapest we're politicians in the world are British. Larry, we should if you start, want to know their price. Well, we, want, we should start a campaign to get Larry Householder properly bribed. But in the meantime, um, you know, he undersold himself and the state. And we think that this uh, uh, HB6, we have a campaign going. Everybody's aware in the state that HB6 needs to be rescinded. But at the same time, we have a single sentence in the Ohio Code that was put in in 2014 that is starting, that is stopping a, a $4 billion worth of wind development along the North Coast in Northern Ohio. So Bob and I are gonna co-write a piece with the help of, uh, of wind advocates pointing out that they, have, they rescind this single sentence in the Ohio Code, which sent, sets an unworkable setback of close to 2,000 feet, when it really should only be less than 1,000. That single uh, sentence has been stopping $4 billion worth of wind development in Ohio, along with countless, really thousands of jobs, a permanent four cent a kilowatt hour uh, uh, electricity cost, with zero impact on the environment, except about one bird a year. I do want to point out the average large commercial windmill kills about one bird a year, but no windmill ever killed a fish. And you know they, these nuclear and coal plants kill literally billions of marine creatures. And the, unless you want to stick the windmill in the lake, that's not going to happen. So what we want to do is combine the campaign to repeal HB6 at least to have a, a definitive article out there about what would happen because all, if we went, if we repeal this wind cause, because if wind comes into Northern Ohio the way it could, the idea of, of nuclear or even coal uh, or oil or gas in Ohio become completely obsolete. There's more than enough capacity, wind capacity in Northern Ohio to power the whole state with, with zero environmental impact. Okay. So, right. uh, wait, can I get a, sorry to pull back here. Um, w let's, this discussion is, um, I, I'm kind of unfamiliar. This is Greg Palast, and I'm just wondering what the, I, I don't know enough about what our event is here one, today. Could someone fill me in? One more minute on it, and then we'll go to you. Uh, no, so, I mean, I'm just, I'm trying to find out what the. Uh, what, no, we, well, you were. Uh, you no, were we're actually going to talk about your book. Oh, I like my right. book. Yes. I, I like to talk, in fact, I like to talk about it. Uh, but no, you know, I'm happy to talk about <laughs> nuclear corruption in and, in Ohio. Right. Well, everybody understands on this call that, especially Tim, who was with us, that we want to push push forward to get the repeal of HB six as soon as possible, and we will be sending you stuff about it, and simultaneously to repeal the uh, setback clause in the Ohio Code, and we'll get enough wind power in Ohio, Greg, to blow your hat off. Okay. Half, the first half is acceptable. Now, okay, the, go um, ahead now. Bob, let's do Greg's book. Well, uh, uh, Greg Panelis, uh hopefully most of you know, he's a best-selling author, New York Times uh, bestsellers list, uh, did the best democracy money can buy, among many things. And uh, again, my phrase for Greg is, uh, go ask Pallas because he's 10 feet tall. He's really one of the two pillars I like to throw myself in, but it's not factually okay. accurate. But him and Bev Harris really, more than anything, created the election integrity movement uh, in America. And uh, I just thought, and you're a great storyteller. The only thing about your stories is they're all factual. And you keep throwing these facts in, Greg. But uh, Ohio Secretary of State Frank LaRose preparing for routine post-election purge in the cleveland.com. Uh, he's gonna purge inactive voters. So I'd like you to tell the listeners here, the audience here, because uh, I think it's the most brilliant part of your book as you dissect first Houston and then Frank LaRose. Uh, yes. Are these inactive voters, do they deserve to be purged? Right. So. So in, uh, this is the book, How Trump Stole 2020, just came out. Um, there's a chapter called Schindler's Blacklist, which is about Ohio. I have several chapters about Ohio and, and Harvey and, and um, um, our whole team here. <laughs> Thank you, Bob, uh, our, in, our stars and heroes of the book. 
But in this chapter, Schindler's Blacklist, I look at the, at the removal of voters from the voter rolls of Ohio. 800,000 voters were removed a few years ago, and it went to the Supreme Court. Why were people removed? Well, they moved. They, you know, if you're in, if you're in, in uh, Columbus and you don't uh, live in Columbus, you shouldn't be voting in Columbus. If you've left Ohio, what the hell are you doing voting in Ohio? In fact, it's a federal crime. It's five years in the freaking slammer. So who's doing this? 800,000 people were really going to vote twice and commit this federal crime? In fact, they should bust them now if you have an intent to commit that crime. It's obviously a massive conspiracy. Or maybe it's not. Maybe the massive conspiracy are what the, pol the conspiracy is what the politicians are doing to these 800,000 voters. So here's what's happening. In Georgia, and, and working in not just Ohio, but in Georgia and Wisconsin and other places, right now, Bob Fatrakis is, I think you've gotten it for us, the, uh, the purge list. Have you got the purge list for us, Bob, yet? You have your homework. You want to walk or where's Bob? Bob, were, were you able to get the purge list for us yet? Uh, no, just sent it out last week, but we're anticipating, they've acknowledged that they uh, have it. And, uh, uh, okay, good. Oh. All right, so what's happening is, is that Bob is working with us as one of my uh, attorneys and um, what we're doing is in Georgia we sued Brian Camp the uh, then Secretary of State of Georgia and we won in federal court and were able to get the purge list that is the people that they're removing from the voter rolls and we just did this in Wisconsin uh, where we are not only uh, there in in Georgia I did it for Salon and then later our crew was hired by Stacey Abrams as you'll see in the book and in Wisconsin extraordinarily while we are investigating, again, there I'm investigating for, uh, well, a major news outlet I can't dis discuss, but um, uh, working for a major news outlet and democracy now, by the way, which I can discuss. Um, but here's the interesting thing. The purge list was given to us by the Board of Elections, which actually thinks the purge list is phony. Three Democrats, three Republicans, bipartisan. They think that the purge list that they've been handed by the Republican legislature 152,000 names is bogus. Well, actually, we got the list from the board, asked us to go through it, and we have, and it's 74% inaccurate. In Georgia, we got, we got our hands, uh, we, I was able to retain the number one, the top experts in the field on whether people have moved or not. Um, and uh, it was really simple. So we, we got the guys from Amazon and eBay who went through every single name in Georgia, every single name in Wisconsin that was on these purge lists. And in Georgia, it was half a million names. And here's what they found. The question is, did these people move? If they moved, they should be removed. If they haven't moved, why are they losing their vote? We found in Georgia, the list was roughly 94% wrong. Um, we know for dead certain that 340,134 voters had never moved, but were removed. They included Christine Jordan, who is, I was at the polling station in Atlanta, the, the schoolhouse where she had voted. This was going to be her 50th year of voting. So in her 50th year of voting, she goes in and is told, you, you're not registered in here anymore. Get out. 92 years old. And by the way, Martin Luther King's cousin. That was Martin Luther King's cousin. Still is Martin Luther King's cousin, and um, I have to say that, uh, needless to say, her real crime was voting while black. 340,000. That's how Stacey Abrams lost 2018. That's how uh, Donald Trump won 2020. That is 17 million people have already been purged from the voter rolls. 17 million already purged, and that's why I say Trump has already stolen 2020. We can steal it back by taking action. In Wisconsin, we're seeing about a 74% error rate in their purge list, but, but well, when I say errors, that is they're saying people have left the, the, the uh, left Wisconsin or their cities. Um, and we're saying, no, they didn't. So I went and, and met with one of these voters, that these ne'er-do-well voters who, who moved out of Milwaukee, but continues to vote in Milwaukee, Saquana Taylor. I asked Saquana Taylor, why are you voting in Milwaukee? It's a crime. You don't live here anymore, according to the state. She says, oh, I haven't moved out of Milwaukee. I'm Milwaukee County Supervisor. I was in her county building <laughs> interviewing her. We're la you know, you could laugh. But, you know, on the other hand, once again, Sequana Taylor, what was, why did they remove her? Once again, voting while black. And uh, now there's another group of people that they've, that they've run through on um, supposed movers. 
they're all in, they're basically, all the movers in Wisconsin are in Milwaukee, the, one of the blackest cities in America, and Madison, Wisconsin. What's in Madison, Wisconsin? The Progressive University of Wisconsin, it has 182,000 students, and one they don't, sure as hell don't want to promote. zones from the 60s, Berkeley, Ann Arbor, Madison. Right, so they're not, the last thing you're going to do is let, yeah, they're not going to let those students vote. So you have this massive wipeout. Now, we're going to take this show on the road and use our experts to go over the Ohio list to prove, to prove, and we know, because we've been through two lists already, they're about three quarters wrong. And so you're talking a good half million people in Ohio, at least. From our studies, we're looking at a half million people, and by the way, we'll give you the names and addresses of every single person wrongly removed. We'll say that's the person. Bob Fatrakis is not removed from his house in years. How come he's being removed? Well, so I, 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 this is what we're doing throughout in several states. Asking, uh, for adding a J to my name, Robert J. Fatrakis instead of Robert Fatrakis. Yes, and, and they'll also say, uh, for example, you know, um, students. Now, again, you're not supposed to lose your vote if you move in Georgia, if you move within your county. Uh, if you move, uh, you're not supposed to uh, lose your vote in, in Wisconsin if you move in your apartment building. As it turns out, Sequana Taylor did move down the street, got a new license, but they didn't update her, uh, her voter file. Now, she doesn't have to. She didn't leave any jurisdiction. Uh, so once again, we are talking about, so a lot of students move dorm room to dorm room. My daughter lost her vote in Georgia because she, they didn't accept her proof of address because she was between dorm rooms. And in fact, the Democratic Party in Georgia, when she called and said, how can you help me register to vote? They said, you're a student here in Georgia? They'll never let you vote. So that's, you know, so once again, uh, we're going after not only Jim Crow, Kim Crow, they're going after the Asian Americans, Jose Crow. And now, I don't know, what do you call it? Student Crow? <laughs> you know, Scholar Crow? I don't know. They're going after students big time because guess what? They're going after voters of color, and the color is blue. I'm not partisan, I'm, I'm a, but I have to tell you, but that doesn't mean I don't know the color of the victims and their, part, and their uh, party preference. So there you are. So that's all uh, in. Aren't these people, don't they have no respect for postcards? I read it in your book. <laughs> it's that these people throw out postcards so they should lose their vote. How does that Right, work? so what happens is, here's how they decided that people have moved in Ohio. Are you ready for this? Well, Bob knows this. You, most of you who are in Ohio, who are activists know this. You lose your, they say you lose your vote in Ohio if you leave Ohio, and that's fair. Bob, you've got to stop voting in Ohio if you've left. But what is their idea of, what is the evidence that you've moved? The evidence that you've moved, according to the Republican secretaries of state you've had, John Houston, the, 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 they say, well, if you miss two federal elections, that is a midterm and a, gen and a uh, presidential, you miss those two elections, that means you've left. Well, what do you mean? Not voting? There's a lot of reasons people don't vote. In fact, most Americans don't vote in the midterms. You miss a second election, you are, you've moved. Now, how do they know you've moved? Now, they confirm it. They send you a postcard. Oh, golly, thank you. Did you know that the postcard it looks and it's designed, our experts are saying it was designed to be thrown away. It's a piece of junk mail. I have a postcard, confirmation postcard from the county of Los Angeles. It's this big, I kid you not. And you don't have to fold anything. If you want to change your registration or where you get your mail-in ballot, everyone gets a mail-in ballot in California, by the way, whether you ask, you know, you don't have to ask for it. It's automatic unless you say, don't give it to me. So it's really simple, really easy to read. And you don't need, and if you do nothing, you still get your ballot. In Ohio, you get a little card, and if you don't return this block of print, you have to fold it three times and sign it and all the, fill out all this crap. You have to fill out your address even though it's already printed on the card, which is pretty funny, right? So people say, what's this? Throw it away. You've just thrown away your vote. Now, this, it went to the Supreme Court. I asked a question when it went up to the court about these people who've supposedly moved. And the evidence, again, the only evidence you've moved, you – didn't vote in two elections in Ohio, and you didn't return a postcard. And again, once Ohio did this, it went everywhere. Then they took it big to Georgia, and then it spread it everywhere. But it started there in Ohio. Now, uh, I asked a simple question. Where's the moving vans? I mean, if you had 800,000 families move from Ohio in two years, uh, Route 80 would be 
blocked and and you'd see you know everything with wheels would be covered with furniture as people are shifting le fleeing the state of ohio that could be pretty empty um and so it, stephen uh justice brayer asked the same question where are the moving vans where are the moving vans and he said obviously not voting and missing a postcard how does that mean that you've moved but the majority five four said if the Secretary of State of Ohio says that's the best evidence he has, he can use that evidence. So what we're doing is saying, well, Mr. Secretary of State, I, we got better evidence from you. We use, are you ready? To, not, not a postcard and missing a vote. That's two data points, two data points. We use 240 data points, 240 data points. Now, does it also include sending you a postcard according to our to our experts, address experts from Amazon and eBay, they said, that's ridiculous. That's why we don't send out postcards. If, if postcards work, you'd get one from Jeff Bezos. Take my word for it. <laughs> uh, second, not voting, how does that count uh, as evidence you've moved? So we use real things like, where do you pay your taxes? Why would you pay income taxes in Ohio if you don't live in Ohio? Why would you be getting your dry cleaning done in Ohio and getting uh, your pizza delivered in Ohio and getting your and watching cable in Ohio if you don't live in Ohio. So we use what most people would consider evidence. And by the way, we also have something else that the state didn't bother with. The state never actually looked at the post office files that you have to be a special contractor. We have the contractors. The state of Ohio literally never looked in the deep files of the post office, never even though if you're a commercial enterprise and you dare send out a mailing to a million people, you better uh, go into the deep, the post office won't even let you mail it, but they were using their sovereign authority to tell the post office to stick it up its, um, its mailbox. This is what I'm worried about. So you, you're not gonna, and why is this so important? One, because it's mostly voters of color and especially, probably more than anything, this, this system hits young people and we know what color their votes are. Uh, massive, massive partisan difference between young people, people under 25 versus people over 65. Finally, it's, it's racial, but the, the other, the thing that really scares me, this is what won Ohio in 2016, the mass purge. That's what won Ohio for uh, Trump. The mass purges won the cross-check purge and other tricks won in Michigan for Trump. Uh, Brian Kemp won Georgia because of this purge game. Now it's going to be far, far, far worse because you can make you can make a request to mail in your ballot, but if you've been read you've been unregistered, they're not going to give it to you, and you don't know it. They don't. It's not like they told you you've been purged, so you're not you're not going to get your mail-in ballot, and that's what we saw in Georgia in Atlanta a few weeks ago and in Milwaukee, you had a whole bunch of voters in line, African-American voters, not because African-Americans like to spend four hours in line and get a chance of dying from a virus or bringing it home to grandma and killing grandma. That's what, not what African-Americans enjoy doing with their, with their Tuesdays. Rather, these were mostly voters who asked for a mail-in ballot and never, never got them because mail-in balloting is the most dangerous balloting you could ever imagine. And, in, and until this year, Greg Powell's rule number one is never go postal, never mail in your ballot. And now this year I have to say, you have to mail in your ballot, but we better figure out a way to protect it. Uh, here's a question. I asked Frank LaRose this question. Mm -hmm. You've got a computer, you've got these people with a little thing inactive, Ohio is a uh, ID state. They have to present ID if they're going to vote at that address. Why would you be purging these people if Citizens. they have to present IDs? Uh, and, and what's the harm in holding them on as inactive because they didn't vote in two elections, some that occur in the same year if it's a special election in the 12th congressional system? In well, in fact, period, yes. You, you can, in fact, you, you know, maybe they just didn't vote because you're right, the majority, the vast majority of people didn't vote in either of those elections. Well, and I want to add something else for those listening, and Bob knows this, so I'm telling you nothing you don't know. 
It's against the law to remove people for not voting. It says right in the National Voter Registration Act of 1993, there's something called the failure to vote clause. And Congress was so intent on making sure you got it that they put it literally in bold type in the law. It says failure to vote. You cannot, an elector, that means a voter, a citizen, an elector can't lose their right to vote, can't lose their registration if they fail to vote or choose not to vote. That's in the federal law. So remember, the Supreme Court said, yeah, the federal law says not voting doesn't mean anything for your registration. However, if you use that as a piece of evidence that you've moved, oh, okay, well, then that's okay. They can skedaddle you as long. So, the, so that's why they added the element of the junk mail postcard because they couldn't just say you didn't vote, so you lose because straight violation of federal law. Oh, let's... Let's add a little postcard. Oh, it's kosher now. But see, when we come up with our list, here's the problem they run into. The federal law is damn clear. And Wisconsin, the, the Wisconsin Board of Elections is very grateful for this. When we give them the list of people wrongly removed, we have the better evidence. In other words, you have to go with the best, most reliable evidence. And since we use 240 databases, including the state's own files, by the way, the state does of Ohio, the state of Wisconsin, the state of Georgia didn't even use their own records, right? Like, you know, your employment records, yeah, your, your you property tax payments, et cetera. Record to the, uh, you know, to the BOE or to the Secretary of State. I mean, why wouldn't they use their own records? Because they want to remove people. It's real simple. So here's what they want to do. They want to purge you. And that's one of the reasons why we have these discussions and why it's not on mainstream television, because when you say it's deliberate, they're doing this to remove voters of color. You've said something, well, it's like a fart at a debutante ball. It's not, it's not acceptable. Uh, but again, it, why isn't it acceptable that you use the, uh, your own databases? Why, why are you purging people when you're making them show ID before they can even vote. I mean, yeah, why can't they just stay on the databases inactive? Because they, they've got to produce the ID. Well, it, the real the answer is really simple, which is that they don't want these people to vote. So it's real simple because they know the color of the voter and they know the color of the voter's ballot, which is blue. And that's just the cold truth. And let's put it this way. DeWine and the rest of your crew in Ohio and Donald Trump can't, there's just not enough white guys to reelect them. There's just not enough white guys. And you look at Ohio. Um, in my film, The Best Democracy Money Can Buy, I think you, well, it's kind of washed out, but there's a poster back here. The Best Democracy Money Can Buy free now on Amazon Prime. Um, we are in Ohio. We're in Ohio and we see the, uh, what's going on there with the massive long lines for black voters with the uncounted ballots. Now, remember I went, uh, Bob was in the film because I showed up at your lovely home after midnight. I'd been waiting with black voters. And this is also in the book. I have a, uh, 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 several chapters on Ohio. One is called Turd Blossom Freaks Out. Turd Blossom is, by the way, uh, Carl Rove. That's the nickname Bush gave to Carl Rove. He freaked out because he knew about the scheme that they had. They had this crazy scheme. Wait, I think I'm fading out on your lighting here. Um, they had a scheme. Just one second. I'm getting some conflicting lighting here. Um, so they had a scheme where you'd wait five hours in line in, the, in black communities in early voting. And we got to the end of the line, instead of giving you a ballot or letting you vote on a machine, they gave you an absentee ballot. I went to the county clerk and said, how come they're being given absentee ballots? There are 80,000 voters in Dayton, 80,000 given absentee ballots. They're not absent, they're right here in, the count, in your office. And there's the machines right there covered with sheets. How come you're handing them absentee ballots? And he said, because the secretary of state called a couple days ago and said, don't let them vote on regular ballots. Don't let them vote on paper ballots or on the machines. They have to vote absentee. And he, and he said, there's only one reason to do that because the absentee ballot can be challenged, can be challenged. And as, so I drove through the night to show Bob that they were handing out these absentee ballots. And Bob goes through these ballots and says, here's the nine places. I'm, tell, I'm, I'm now quoting you while you're sitting there. You can probably do it yourself. But Bob was showing me how you can 
you know, you can make a mismark here and uh, don't put in your proper address there that you registered with and you left off the middle initial of your, of your middle name when you registered with your middle initial, et cetera, et cetera. It's a million below ways to- Hardly below the line. You sign, yeah, your, your pen dripped just below a line. So what's happened is it's an easy way to disqualify black votes because 70% of African-Americans vote early in Ohio, 70%. And so if you can knock out those absentee ballots, uh, all they have to do is knock out, you know, 100,000 of them. And, um, and uh, um, Romney would be president. People don't know how close Romney came to being president there. And uh, so... But they did a much better job when Trump uh, when Trump came in. But they tried it. They tried the game out with um, in twelve and sixteen. And this, I did that story for Democracy Now. But it's in how Trump stole twenty twenty. And I just want to show you one other thing from Ohio, and then I'll stop yakking. Um, let's see. I just saw it. Uh, I don't know if I can find it. Uh, <laughs> I just had it in my hand. In, in How Trump Stole 2020. Um, well, here's what it is. When I went to uh, the early voting for black folk in Dayton, Ohio, there was a five hour line to, to vote. Then I went to the white suburbs of Toledo to see how long the line was there. And you'll see the two photos in the book. You'll see the, the black voters who, by the way, they're not only waiting five hours in line, they're waiting five hours in line in a cold open parking lot in November in Ohio. And I go to the white voting station to see how long the line is. There is zero line. There is no line. And in fact, when you go in, there's cookies and coffee for the, uh, for the white voters who show up and you know, run in from their SUVs. So that's welcome to uh, the new Jim Crow voting of America. This is what we have to be careful of, and especially its interplay now. Things are going to be far worse because of mail-in voting. And why do you say that? I'm sorry? Because of the percentage that will never be counted? Yes. So here's the deal. MIT, now I have in, again, in How Trump Stole 2020, a chapter called Mail-In Madness. Now, I don't, please Please, please, if I hear one more person saying to me, oh, Greg Palace agrees with Trump that mail-in voting is bad. No, he says mail-in voting leads to voter fraud. There is no voter fraud. In fact, I did a calculation, which is from Lorraine Minitti, who is the number one vote fraud expert in America from Rutgers. Uh, I calculated that you are 540% more likely to be hit and killed by lightning than cast a fraudulent vote. <laughs> so while all the, so when Trump says we're gonna be flooded by a million ballots from Venezuela, what he's doing is he's distracting liberals who say, oh no, no, voting by mail is easy, it's no problem. No, it's not easy, it's a big problem. According to MIT, which has been studying this for years, 22% of all mail-in ballots are never counted 22 percent one in five and as a, as the professor who, who did the study said directed it said you know if one in five in precinct ballots were never counted there'd be riots one in five mail-in votes aren't counted and people go eh. now understand the two ways they're not counted first and foremost one in ten voters who seek a mail-in ballot never get them you know, and Bob, I know that you went to law school, so you will understand this concept probably better than some people, because I can't get most, I can't get Democrats to understand this one. It's a very difficult one. So pay careful attention. If you don't get your ballot mailed to you, you can't mail it back in. Let me repeat that. If you don't get the ballot, you can't mail it in. So mail-in voting is very difficult for those who don't get the ballot, because mailing in that, that big ball of air doesn't get counted. So one in 10 mail-in voters never gets their vote. And so the other one in 10, totaling one in five thrown out, one in 10 ballots mailed in is challenged and not counted. One in five, excuse me, one in 10 mail-in ballots mailed in never get counted. 
Now, I looked at the EAC numbers. If you're a soldier, the chance you will get your uh, mail-in ballot is, uh, you, the chance you won't get your mail-in ballot is one out of three. The ballots never don't get to the soldiers. And if they mail it, mailing them back in, forget about it. I just spoke, by the way, to um, a group of uh, expats in China having a meeting about mailing in. And um, they said, you know, they mail in their ballots a month in advance if they can get them, uh, and they just don't get counted. So foreign, but, but now we're all foreigners uh, because they don't want you to mail in your ballot. And of course they put, well, how can they challenge your ballot? All the things that, that Bob said to me about absentee ballots in Ohio, you, you don't, they don't like, someone challenges your signature. You got all these schmucks who don't know anything about the standards for determining whether a signature is legitimate. But I, you know, it's just some boogaloo moron in a Hawaiian shirt says, I don't like that signature. Why do we allow that even in America? What is this stuff where you can point at someone's ballot and say, don't count it? It's, it's insane. But that's what we do. And the biggest single problem on that is that there's no challenge to the challenge. Uh, you know, as we know, I've been through two counts of, of opening of mail-in and provisional ballots. And in both cases, you had Republican $600 an hour and $800 an hour lawyers from the Republican Party saying, don't count that ballot, don't count that ballot, don't count that ballot. And the number of lawyers from the Democrats were exactly zero in attendance. And then uh, you had the Green Party <laughs> trying to defend Democratic Party ballots. That's how it works. <laughs> I believe it. Yeah. But that's only after the Democrats refused to, I mean, uh, I ended up being the attorney, as you well know, and you did a lot of good reporting uh, uh, on the recount. You probably know more than anyone where uh, where the votes uh, were lost. And the reality is that Clinton uh, uh, won that election. Yes. And so I, I bring out the point. The only way I can say with uh, with certainty that Trump has stolen 2020 is that he stole, I can, I show you in detail how he stole 2016 and they haven't changed. Let me see if I can change my direction here. So, you, okay, that's better. You can see me a little. Um, the problem is, is that uh, again, they're not counting all the ballots. And yes, that was a big problem in Michigan. In Michigan, supposedly Trump won by 10,000 votes, 10,700 votes. But 75,000 votes, 75,355 to be exact, were never counted in, in Detroit because 87 scanning machines broke down and didn't count the votes. By the way, that's the main way that scanners steal your vote. They just don't scan. They just don't record the vote. They break down. They don't record the vote. And so 87 machines break down in the Detroit area. Who are, Detroit, you know, who are the Detroit voters? I actually met one, Carlos Garcia, who was right there when he saw that his vote was not counted because they took his paper ballot and they opened up the back of the scanner and just put it in there instead of running it through the scanner. He said, what are you doing? He said, well, said, the scanners, yeah. we said the scanner's broken. So then when they went to the so-called recount paid for by Jill Stein was in fact counting of the ballots which were never previously counted. That's the big thing. The ballots that weren't previously counted were going to be counted. Uh, Donald Trump went to court in Lansing. Uh, the great Bob Fatrakis did his best and, and, and the Jill Stein team. But the problem was, is that it was up to Hillary Clinton, not Jill Stein. She didn't have legal standing according right. to the law because you count all the ballots all you want, Jill won't win. So it was up to Hillary and, and her response, is, as has been reported to me, was that... Um, when the judge said, do you want, does Secretary Hillary want to continue the count? What does she want to do? And the answer was from the Democrats, we're just here to observe, which happens to be her campaign slogan. <laughs> oh, man. Are you ready for some questions? Yeah, I'll take some questions. You got the yeah. answers. Go ahead. Uh, and, and again, let me, uh, let me show this. Highly recommended. And the comics in there are outrageous as well. They're just... Yeah. A, a Ted Rawl, the, the great... Uh, investigative comic book reporter. Uh, and, and it uh, is really reporting. It's really, uh, I could use it in political science class. Please do. I want people to steal all these cartoons. In fact, if you want the color version, I'll shoot those to you too. All right. And, and uh, by the way, I've got the audio book uh, will be out shortly, as well as um, Como Trump Robo 2020, the Spanish language edition. Muy bueno. All right. Okay, go ahead. Go ahead, Pete. Go ahead, Pete. 
Hey, Greg, thanks for joining us tonight. Um, my question is that I understand that mail-in voting in the past is very safe and there's no fraud involved and all that, but with what Donald Trump is doing to the post office, aren't we asking, aren't we giving him another way to steal an election by mailing in ballots instead of um, doing early voting? Well, I, I want to disagree with you on one thing. You, you made two statements that mail-in balloting used, uh, was not was not fraudulent. We don't have any history of fraud in mail-in balloting. That's 100% correct. His claim of fraud is bullshit. The claim that the statement that um, mail-in voting is safe is completely wrong. More than one in five ballots are never counted. It's the most dangerous way you could ever conceive of voting. And I know a lot of people are concerned about going into voting machines where, where, the, where you have partisan officials who can manipulate those machines. However, the solution is not to mail them your vote where they can say they never got it, where they can say right. postage due. What, 100? According to the EAC, it was over 100,000 votes were lost to postage due. 626,000 votes challenged for signature. And you have to have some time. And remember, in most states, not most states, it, well, in many states, you're going to have to include a photo of your voter ID. Most people don't realize that, or they'll send in the wrong ID. Uh, second, in states like Wisconsin and Michigan, you're going to have to have a witness signature, unless you're in Alabama, in which case you're going to have to have two witness signatures, and if not two witness signature, a, uh, an affidavit. You're, it's going to have to be notarized. Notarized! And the Supreme Court just approved that, that poll tax, in effect. So mail-in voting is absolutely the worst, most insane way, most dangerous, most ridiculous way to vote should be avoided at all course, costs, except this year when I'm telling you to vote by mail, I am going to vote by mail. Okay? The guy who said you should never vote by mail, I'm voting by mail. For a simple reason. You know why? There's only one thing worse than losing your vote, and that's losing your life. And I don't want you to lose your life. So what do we do? We have to come up with ways to protect the mail-in vote. And I'm really sick of Democrats saying, mail-in votes are wonderful. They have always worked. We've had them for 100 years. Look how well they do in Oregon. Oregon is not America. Wake up. Oregon is not America. California and Washington are not America. In California, Washington, Oregon, they mail you a ballot automatically. It has postage return that you don't have to add in photo IDs or any of that crap. And if they, someone tries to challenge your ballot, they will contact you and say, is that your signature or not? But not in, not in, in, well, in America, and America is Ohio and Wisconsin and Georgia and Michigan and Missouri. You mail in your ballot, you're playing Russian roulette with your, with your uh, democracy. But you're gonna so, have to do I mean, it. You're gonna have to do it. Just I understand that on, um, you know, that if you vote on election day, there's going to be long lines, especially in the poor neighborhoods, and it's a dangerous thing to do. But they're not necessarily long lines if you do early voting in Ohio, because you have a whole month to do it. That's and right. I Thank think you. people ought to take the same risk that they take going to a grocery store once a week to do their I, duty I agree. to fact, vote. It, I don't it, think... Mm -hmm. I don't think COVID's a good excuse for not voting early and in person. Well, uh, you know, I'll tell you something. I'm 68. I have one lung from a, uh, from a, uh, a, a well, medical I'm 66 lung accident. and I go to work every day. I have one lung. I'm 66 and I go to work every and, day. So. And, uh, and I have a heart condition. So between all of that, um, I think that I should mail in my vote, but I, I will do this. Like in California, I will get the mail-in ballot, but I'll drop it off at one of the many, many bo uh, drop boxes we have. That's the other thing. And Bob, you can tell me in Ohio, can you get a mail-in ballot and then walk it in? Is it possible? You're muted, Bob. Bob, I think you're muted. Carl Rove has muted Bob once again. Yes. <laughs> uh, you can, but you can only do it at one location the Board of Election, one per county by law. Uh, but that battle's going on. Uh, Legal Women Voters, A. Philip Randolph are all going, why can't you have more than, you know, one box, one set of boxes? 
uh, out at an old strip mall, a former Kohl's department store at the edge of the county. Right. So here's, yeah, I, right, we should fight for these things. One thing I want to be, tell people to be very careful about, for example, in Wisconsin, a court said you didn't need a witness signature. They said in the middle of a virus, this is insane to require people to have contact with others to get a witness signature, right? Um, but then, so uh, several thousand people sent in their ballots without the witness signature. And then the state Supreme Court, I think two days before the election said, uh, oh, no, you got to have the witness signature. So thousands of votes were thrown in the garbage because they didn't have that witness signature. And even, even though they're going by a court ruling, um, someone said to me, you said that in Michigan, you need a witness signature when the uh, secretary of state has now issued a, an, uh, a statement that, uh, that you don't need a witness signature. Well, unfortunately, the secretary of state is not the law of the land in Michigan. The law of the land is the state legislature, which says you do need a, a, a witness signature. So if you don't add the witness signature that's required by law, because the ACLU has won some temporary lawsuit, at a lower court level, you're out of your damn mind. Follow all the rules and assume that none are waived. Assume none are waived. In case you haven't seen the Supreme Court, which has renamed itself, by the way, the White Citizens Council, is that appropriate? I don't know. Um, um, but you know, it's honest. Um, so that's your court that's gonna decide on these rules ultimately. I wouldn't skip anything. And if you, if it says in uh, Missouri, notarize your ballot, I know that the secretary of state of Missouri said, oh, you don't have to. Well, I wouldn't go by that at all. I'd notarize your mail-in ballot. Absolutely. Follow every damn stupid, moronic, vicious Jim Crow rule that they can throw at you. Follow it. So um, we have a, a chat saying, uh, hi, Greg, loved your book. Everybody buy it, mark it up. And then the question this person has is, which is the question that we've all had since like 2000 is why, what the heck is wrong with Gore, Kerry and Clinton? Why do they give in? I mean, every single one of them gave in. I mean, uh, we were stuck with the Green Party and meager reserves in election after election. Yes. Uh, two things. One, uh, I'll, I'll be a little subtle on it. If you read the, the book and its footnotes, okay, I have, I have footnotes about Gore and Kerry. Uh, Gore knew, when I uncovered for The Guardian and BBC television back in 2000, that Catherine Harris had removed tens of thousands of black men from the voter rolls, calling them felons. Of course, their only crime was voting while black. Zero, not a single one of those African Americans on the felon purge list were felons, not one. And later they, they admitted that. Um, but, and they said, and they sent out letters of apology from the Bush inauguration, right? That's how he became president. But Al Gore knew in advance about my story, just so you know, because we needed a comment and he knew in advance about the story. And, um, Sidney Blumenthal said, we've got, oh my God, we've got the evidence of exactly how they stole in Florida. And then, um, Gore said, well, who's the writer of this article from The Guardian? And they said, Greg Pallast. And he said, oh, we hate that SOB. Uh, but, so, but that's not why he didn't go ahead with it. He was talked out of challenging the election by people, the old gray heads like Christopher Warren, uh, who, uh, Chris, yeah, who said to him, look, you know, you're not going to be on any boards. You're not going to run again. You know, he wanted to run for reelection, but he did fine. He got a Nobel Peace Prize. He's a billionaire. Um, he's been, you know, he's been a wonderful hot air salesman. He's been just, you know, so he's, he's done fine. And if he had bitched, he wouldn't be doing fine. They'd punish him. Uh, John Kerry was a bit different at, yes, he grabbed his ankles he, he right did, away. He, he knew they stole it and counted it in Chattanooga and ripped them off with ballots and purged a quarter of the people in Cleveland. He knew that, didn't he? Well, what happened with Kerry if you remember, there was a kid that was tasered. Remember Taser Boy? Oh, yeah. He was asking, he was asking um, John Kerry a question. Wait, hang on. I'll, help, I'll illustrate. Uh, he had Greg's book in his hand. This is, my, this is one of my other books, but this is Vulture's Picnic. But he had my book. He was holding my book, Our Madhouse, in his hand, and he's holding it up, what the Washington Post called a strange 
yellow book. I don't know how strange it was. I was on the Washington Post bestseller list. And they said, uh, so he was holding up my book saying to Carrie, Greg Palace said you won in Ohio. Why did you concede? She, he said, have you read, have you read Greg Palace's book? And they threw him, the cops threw him down on the ground and tased him. Carrie didn't know he'd been thrown on the ground and tased and no one listened to his answer. He said, I did read, I did read Greg Palace's book. And he was right about the election. So this is four years later and John Kerry said, yes, I was cheated out of Ohio. Greg was right, but he never, other than that one mention, I've never heard him say any other time. Yeah, uh, they shafted me out of the presidency, but it's not about him. And this is what I don't, what I resent about guys like these, uh, these rich, rich kids like Gore and Kerry and, and Clinton, you know, um, when you're a demi-billionaire, it's like, ah, I'll go do something else. So I'm not president. I'll still, uh, I'll still live large. But in the case of, um, um, so, so what's happened is it's not their vote. And that's what I, upsets me. It wasn't their votes to throw away. It was votes of young people and especially votes of African-Americans. It wasn't their votes. They weren't Ohio voters. They weren't Florida voters. They should stay the hell out of it and let people challenge. And they actually, as we saw in Michigan, they actually got in the way. Why? We could all have theories, but I, I don't want to speculate. Well, they, uh, I mean, Gore literally stopped the challenge in the Senate, uh, kind of figuratively, uh, as well as, uh, I mean, Hillary Clinton later told me uh, when I was talking to her after 04 that he begged and pleaded uh, not to get involved, that uh, just to let it happen. Well, again, I can't guess why. I mean, I, but I think most of it is, look, they're all one party. There are not Democrats and Republicans. There's, the par there's what I call uh, the Hezbo Shekel, the party of the cash, right? And they're one little club and they're all happy with each other. So it doesn't, if, even if one loses, well, another member of the club is won. So the club wins again. That's the important thing. The club wins again every time. Uh, question? No, yeah. no. I, yeah, there's yeah. a question on the screen that said if you get an absentee, it might be specific to Ohio. Well, okay, what go ahead. happens, yeah, if you have an absentee and you, and you decide not to use it and you go to the poll, uh, are you putting yourself at risk? I think so. Yes, you are putting yourself at risk. Um, but I agree with the, um, with the participant here who suggested that we go in and vote early. Now, I was at UCLA, I was here in Los Angeles. On election day, uh, right out, uh, I'm near the Hollywood Bowl. The people, we vote at the Hollywood Bowl, uh, some of us, and uh, the lines at the Hollywood Bowl were two and a half, three hours long. It was crazy. Again, because our uh, violently partisan Catherine Harris named Alex Padilla during the primary, of course, supporting Joe Biden did not want students and independents to get their ballots. So they didn't get ballots with the presidential election. So they had a, again, the usual thing, they didn't get their correct ballots. So they lined up for two hours. I voted, I had my mail-in ballot, but I walked it in and dropped it off midweek at UCLA. And um, there was no one there. There were about 10 poll workers. And in the hour I was there filming, three voters came in. This is UCLA with 100,000 students and faculty. Three people came in to vote. And then on election day, of course, it was hours and hours of waiting. Why do people think election day instead of election month is a big, big mistake? It's one thing we should be working on. Go in, vote early. No one's there midweek in the afternoon and the early evening. No one's there. And then after that, if you can't do that, uh, do a drop box, take it to your county uh, board of elections. And by the way, a good reason to do that is in a lot of states, they will verify your signature and validate your ballot on the spot. I don't know if they do that in Ohio. So you don't have it. So you can't be challenged later. They'll verify it in front of you in some states. So early voting best, drop off second best, mail in third best. And of course, if you have to, election day. But again, you know, then it's all the precautions, all the precautions. 
or you could end up uh, getting it uh, called off 12 hours before the polls open as we did in Ohio. For the primary. <laughs> and then yeah. say, and then there's a law in Ohio which nobody knew, only homeless and disabled can vote at the Board of Election on Election Day. There's a woman on this call, Juanita Brown, and I'll just tell her story quick. She doesn't really leave her house too much, but she was doing a mail-in for the primary. And of course, she's a Democrat. She's a black woman. She asked for her, uh, she had to fill out an application, get her ballot sent to her, a Republican ballot. Yeah, well, there was a lot of that going on. They, they were, they were giving her the wrong bad ballot. ballot. The primary. So of course, too much time had passed for her to mail it back in. So she had to supposedly be able to drop it off down there that she wasn't homeless or disabled so well they wouldn't let her in who, to vote, I mean, did she her vote get counted? we don't know we don't know so that's another trick but, but what we do know is how trump stole 2020 it's out there you said we can steal it back uh, i highly recommend it not just because you're very kind to me in the book uh you point out you stopped at my house at midnight what you didn't point out is I went to bed after I explained it to you in a half hour when I knew you went out and worked in the carriage house. And right, I stay up all, all night taking, uh, right, I was uh, creating a report for Democracy Now! So, so Bob graciously allowed me to um, kind of catnap and, and work with my team at, uh, in his back house there uh, for, uh, and we produced a report for Democracy Now! which broadcast in the morning. And I don't understand why our broadcast didn't save the whole thing. How come Hillary isn't president? Something went wrong there. So how is the best, what's the best way? Do you want people to go to your website or to go to Amazon? Uh, okay, obviously get the book in any darn way you can, including shoplifting. I get the same uh, royalty whether you shoplift it or steal it or whatever. Oh, I, 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 I never recommend criminal activity. Uh, but, uh, um, but the, the other thing is um, you do go to gregpalace.com to get the follow-up announcements and the follow-up investigations that I'm going to be doing in Ohio with Robert Fetrakis. And I'm going to, I know I'm getting, going to be getting, whether I like it or not, I'm getting a ton of really good information from Harvey Wasserman. So you'll see some of that incorporated in my stuff, including, by the way, I don't want to drop the nuclear corruption issue. I spent a lot of my life investigating nuclear corruption and uh, the fact that it's come back is, uh, is uh, more than sickening. And uh, in fact, actually, you'll hear about nuclear corruption. That was the center of the race in Georgia between Stacey Abrams and Brian Kemp. The reason she lost, that is the reason why the Koch brothers and others backed all these vote thieving schemes is because Brian Kemp agreed to have state massive taxpayer subsidies of the last nuclear plant under construction in America, Plant Votal. And that was, that was the issue. The, the number one overwhelming issue in Georgia was payment for this nuclear plant. And so Georgia Power uh, got uh, big time behind Brian Kemp. And by the way, as a payoff to Georgia Power, you'll love this, instead of paying cash, okay? Uh, well, uh, well, because in this case, um, Brian Kemp owed Georgia power. So what he did was he took a board, member of their board of direct, uh, directors, Kelly Leffler, and made her a U.S. senator over the objections of Donald Trump. So it just shows you the nuclear industry is far more powerful than Agent Orange. Wait, okay, now. You were muted. Oh, that, that's the final <laughs> word from Greg Palace. Final. Thanks for being uh, at the Second Saturday Salon. Keep up the great work. Thank you and very again, much. And again, go ask Palace because he's 10 feet tall. By the book. Pillar of the election integrity movement. Thank you so Appreciate much, Bob. Your work, man. Send me a, a link. We'll get it out. Thanks. Bye. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. And thanks, and I, Brian Curtis, for the kind words. All right. And Tom Over needs to sing right now. I think Trey needs to make him a panelist again. I shall. Let's find Tom and put him up on the stage. There you go, Tom. Uh, here he comes. Just join the panelists. Unmute, please. There you go.
Oh, I'll try to do something. It's late. I'm in a house with sleeping people. Let's see. All right. So do you want a song? <laughs> Hello? Yes, if you can. I'm oh. sorry. I know people would be sleeping this early. If, if, can you, can you stop uh, who sleeping? knows? <laughs> That's great. That's a great, great program, though. Let me see if I can do something here. Hang on a minute. Sure. Uh, all right. Can you start your vi video? Uh, let's see. I have to get all set up. You had a pretty good setup last time with the um, earth behind you. Oh, all right. Cool. That was, that was pretty cool. Uh, well, I'll just do a simple song here, I guess. If that's what you want. Sure. Along the themes of, uh, uh, here we go. Along the themes of Earth. Oh, that's great. Can you see me? Yes, we can see you now. All right, that's good enough. All right, well, just got to contribute something here, I guess, right? <laughs> there you go. All right. Just learn this today, lucky like it's simple. You may have a million dollars. You may own the city block. You may own airplanes. But no, my son, don't care, baby. Don't care what you want. When it all comes down, you got to go back to Mother Earth. You may have an army of lobbyists, you may buy elections too, but when the time comes, we'll all be through with. Don't care, baby, don't care what you're worth. When it all ends up, you got to go back to Mother Earth. That's the short version of it. Is that enough, Suzanne? Uh, <laughs> Mother Earth. <laughs> <laughs>